I was on duty as a park ranger at the state park near Augusta, Georgia, when I got a call from a driver who reported hitting something on the road. It was around 3 a.m., and I could hear the panic in his voice as he asked for help with filing an accident report. I did my best to calm him down and provide him with the necessary information. Later that day, the driver called back, still in disbelief. He said the damage to his vehicle was much bigger than what a deer could cause, but there was no blood, markings, or body to be found. He ruled out the possibility of it being a car or a rock, and he thought it might have been a mountain lion, although it was smaller than a full-grown deer. I consulted with my colleagues, and we were all puzzled by the incident. We were familiar with the wildlife in the area, and we had never seen any animal that could cause such damage without leaving any evidence behind. We even went out to the area to investigate, but we found nothing. The official police report listed the incident as a deer collision, and the insurance company also agreed with that assessment. However, the driver was adamant that it was not a deer. Sadly, the driver passed away two years later, and the mystery of what he hit on that road remained unsolved. As a park ranger, I am used to dealing with all kinds of wildlife, but this incident still puzzles me to this day. What could have caused that much damage without leaving any evidence behind? It's a mystery that may never be solved. This happened in the late 90s. I, Catherine, and my friend Rose met him together. My stalker was a guy, Rose, and I met on the bus one day coming home from my volunteer work after school as a candy striper at the local hospital. We were on the bus going home laughing and talking, and this guy just randomly sits by us and starts talking. He tells us his name and we laugh, thinking he said his name was gay, yeah, stupid teenage girls. He corrected us and said his name was Jay. We talked a bit more and innocently gave him our names and he asked for my number, but I said no. He was like seven years older and kinda strange the more we talked to him. He got annoyed but whatever right, so we thought that was that. A few days, maybe a week later me and the same friend run into Jay while switching buses downtown. I was going to her house like I did a few times a week when we run into him. He asked for me to hang out and watch him play hockey that night. I said no, I was going to my friends. He got weirdly annoyed and kept trying and bagging me, telling me about how much fun it would be and trying to get me away from my friend. He really didn't want her to come to this hockey game either, just wanted it to be us so weird. Our bus finally came and we got out of there fast. Over the next few weeks I kept running into him downtown Al, it was like he knew my schedule and every time I tried to be nice but get away as fast as I could. And every time he would get annoyed because I wouldn't hang out. A few weeks pass and I'm at school and in walks Jay. I was so mad and frustrated and I snap on him. Why was her here and how did he know what school I went to? Did he follow me on the city bus? He tried saying that he was there to see his friends, but he wasn't with anyone, just a 25-year-old guy wandering around a high school. After that I would randomly see him on my bus, and he would always try to sit across from me and watch. He would still ask for us to hang out, and I would still say no. As time went on, he would still find me on the bus and sit across from me with who I guessed was his girlfriend, or a girl he was trying to make me jealous with. He would look at me while making out with her. He would do everything he could to make me feel uncomfortable. I would either turn up my music and do my best to ignore him or move to another spot. Nothing ever seemed to deter him. He never did anything bad enough to call the police, but he knew it was wrong and he knew it bothered me and he knew I would have a panic attack and I'm sure he got off on that. As the years went on, I would see less and less of him. He would randomly pop up and make me uncomfortable. He started standing really close to me and trying to talk. I would have a panic attack and do my best to ignore him. I would still walk away and he would just get more pushy. Every time I would run into him, I text my friend that was there when we first ran into him and get her to calm me down. It's now 2023 so 24-ish years since it all started and I haven't seen him in the last maybe 8 plus years and I'm just praying that I never see him again. I'm 43 so he must be going on 50 
and I'm still scared to run into him. I have thought I saw him a few times in panic, but it wasn't him. I hope I never see him again. This is the only paranormal experience I've ever had at least that I can remember. It was many years ago when I was eight years old. I randomly woke up in the middle of the night, not uncommon for me, and turned over in the bed to readjust. When I did that, I opened my eyes and saw a person, or humanoid-like figure, wearing a black robe that covered over its head with a hood, and draped down to its feet. I remember seeing a string around the hood as well. When I saw this thing, I instantly knew it was real, and I knew it wasn't a random person in my house. I didn't have words to explain the feeling, but I knew I wasn't dreaming, and it was not a figment of my imagination. It was way too real, and I remember the immediate fear that went through my body. The second I saw it, I grabbed my covers and yanked them over my head, went into fetal position and closed my eyes. I was terrified. I didn't know what I was seeing, why there was some random person, figure standing next to my bed. I laid there trying to calm myself down, refusing to remove the covers from over me. I felt protected under them. I eventually fell back asleep, and that was the end of it. I've never had any other experience even remotely like that. I grew up never mentioning it to anyone, thinking I'd be called crazy. Until I found this sub just now. I felt comfortable enough and wanted to share my experience and ask your guys' thoughts, opinions. So this happened to me and my mom a few years ago. We were talking in the living room. It was daylight outside and the shutters were closed. There was no light turned on inside of the living room, and all the light that we could see came from the outside through the shutters. All of the sudden, the atmosphere in the room became very heavy, and we both stopped talking and I don't know why, but we both instantly looked at the windows. We could very clearly see through the shutters a silhouette of a human figure walking by as if he, she was outside of the house. I don't know how to best describe if not by a shadow. The shadow of that person was very dark itself like Fanta Black or something. It was very, very chilling. I remember feeling very dense and heavy, like I couldn't talk or move as it was walking by. Later, me and my mom tried to reproduce it. One of us stayed inside while the other walked by outside just like the figure did, but it was very different from what we saw. Has this ever happened to any one of this sub? Does anyone know what this might suggest? Sorry for any eventual grammar mistake. English is not my native language. Okay, so back in 2008 when I lived in Kentucky, we went for a weekend up at a campground about two hours from our house. Twin Knobs was my favorite place to go all through childhood. It had a little beach set up right at the lake where a good portion of the visible water was buoyed for swimmers. This particular time, my cousin Anna had come along with us. We were swimming out to the border when we spotted this old man. Not thinking anything of it, we continued to wait around. I looked back and saw the old man swimming under the boundary line, then popping back up to laugh like a lunatic. I gave my cousin the look, and we made our way back to shore as unnoticeable as possible. I looked behind me to see the freak with his mouth underwater, following us insanely close. I yelped and we made a mad dash to my mom on the shore. We ran over to tell the lifeguard. He was about 18 or so and looked almost hungover. We pointed out the guy who was still in the water, and he told us he couldn't do anything about it because he hadn't seen him. Just then, the guy came out of the water in a speedo and lay down on the sand. The lifeguard laughed and said, Old Coot thinks he's hot. We rolled our eyes and went back to my mom, carefully avoiding the sight of the freak. We got lunch and then walked up the hill to leave. Just as we got to the car, Anna looked over and saw the old guy on the ground naked. He was sticking his hand under a car tire. He got up and did this about three more times to different cars until he came back up with a key. My mom was on the phone with 911 while we all hid behind a random SUV. He unlocked the car and sat inside. It was a silver Volvo with a sorority sticker on the back. He got out of the car with a camera and took pictures of people's license plates, including ours. 
He got back in and sped away out of the parking lot. We had to stay an extra two hours at the ranger station so my mom could help fill out the police report. And that concludes my experience with a lunatic. This was last year. I was living with my grandmother at the time. We had no neighbor to the left because we were at the end of a street, but on the right was a man named Rick. Rick always gave me bad vibes. He would do weird shit like sing really, really loudly. So loudly we could clearly hear it into our house. He also had about 10 pit bulls in his garage, which was weird in itself. But not once did I see him take even one on a walk. Poor dogs. This is the thing that got to me the most. One of my friends that had moved to Long Beach kind of along with me came over to chill one day. She parks her car and I run out to greet her because I'm annoying like that. And she sees Rick loading something into his car and she goes, Oh my God, I know him. That's the creepy guy who hit on me and insert friend's name here while we were walking out of a store. Apparently he has told them that he had just moved to the area and needed cute girls to hang out with. That bugged me because Rick had lived in that house for at least five years. I confronted him about it one day and he was just super creepy about it, so I walked away and sort of let it be. I moved away eventually, but just a few weeks ago, I was browsing the internet when I found an article about the guy who played the Red Power Ranger murdering his roommate. At the bottom of the article showed a picture of the man, and what do you know? Creepy ass Rick's face. A couple of years ago, I decided to take my large dog, a 175-pound Rottweiler Mastiff, for a walk at a nearby state park. The park had many trails, but I chose the less traveled ones to avoid frequent interruptions from curious people wanting to pet my dog or ask questions. We walked across the top of the dam and through the woods, crossing a large valley and entering another set of woods. We didn't encounter any other walkers along the way. In the second set of woods, the trail was narrow, and I walked behind my dog. The trees were dense, and the vegetation along the edges of the trail reached my shoulders. As we approached a bird-watching stand, my dog suddenly stopped, growling and baring his teeth. He became increasingly agitated, looking like a scene from Cujo. I couldn't see anything that could have triggered his reaction. After calming him down, I managed to drag him to the edge of the woods. As I stood there catching my breath, I spotted a man dressed in black creeping out of the woods. Feeling alarmed, I reported him to the ranger service. They caught him shortly after, hiding in the woods with a hunting knife and duct tape. In February last year, me and a bunch of friends went camping at Moss Park, a county park to the southeast of Orlando. This county park is on a forested island with two large lakes to the east and west and two extensive nature preserves to the north and south. We were just hanging around the campfire drinking beers and smoking pot. Around 11 p.m., me and three of the friends decided to go for a walk into the nature preserve to the south. Our destination was a dock on a pond cove of the large lake to the west. I normally am not the type to go walking around in the woods in the dark. I do a lot of hiking, but always during the daytime hours. I guess being slightly inebriated and with friends made me braver than usual. So we went trekking off into the woods in the dark with nothing but a flashlight to protect us. At first the trail was taking us through a large swamp and nothing felt out of the ordinary. Next the trail entered a thick pine forest. Here things began to feel a bit different and in retrospect it was very quiet, but I wasn't concerned at the time. We got to the dock and started shining the flashlight around hoping to see some alligators. There were no alligators, no bugs, and no sign of life in general. I thought it was a bit odd, but again I wasn't too concerned. Then all of a sudden something changed. Within a few seconds, all four of us said something along the lines of, Do you feel that? Something all of a sudden felt very wrong. Then one of my friends said, Listen to how quiet it is. We all shut up and listened. It was insanely quiet. Not a single frog, insect, or bird. Even the wind had stopped. It was the quietest thing I had ever heard in my life. 
It was like we were inside a vacuum. Remembering this lack of sound gives me chills to this day. Next, we all remarked how cold it was getting. I started getting goosebumps. It felt like the barometric pressure had just plummeted. At this point, we all agreed that we needed to get the F out of here. There was a strong feeling of impending danger, like something wanted us to leave an SOP and we would be in big trouble if we didn't. I was able to feel that all of this energy was coming from across the pond towards us. I think all of my friends could feel this as well, because we were all focused on the pond. Nobody was paying any attention to the dark woods behind us. It felt like a charge of energy was running through my body, and I could feel exactly the direction that this energy was coming from. We all agreed that we had to leave and started walking back at a fast pace. The bad feelings were still present while we were walking back through the pine forest. One of my friends actually started crying. I was not too worried though, I felt like we would be okay as long as we kept walking. Once the trail exited the pine forest and entered the swamp, all the bad feelings were immediately lifted. It was like we had crossed some sort of threshold and everything felt fine again. I think we may have been run off by a Sasquatch because I've seen them myself on a few occasions and I've heard that they can put these bad feelings into people, but we didn't see anything so I can't say for sure what it was. About 15 minutes after getting back to the campfire where the rest of our friends were, we heard what sounded like someone or something whacking a tree with a big stick one time just across the campground. This may have been related to what happened earlier. The campground host immediately got up and started walking around with a light, as if they were equally surprised by this sound, or possibly this kind of thing had happened before. I had to leave the next morning to go to work, but some of my friends stuck around and went back to the dock during the daylight hours, and they reported that nothing was out of the ordinary this next time. I still go hiking a lot, but I am not planning on doing any more hiking in the dark. It felt like we were in legitimate danger, like whatever it was could have made us disappear if we didn't leave it as a pee. In June 2018, I had taken a trip to Grand Teton National Park, hoping to visit the popular area near Jenny Lake. However, upon arrival, I discovered that the area had been closed to the public due to concerns over expanding cracks and fissures in a large rock formation. Disappointed but undeterred, I decided to explore other parts of the park. While Yellowstone had been in a perpetual state of unrest with its steamboat geyser erupting constantly, I had never expected to witness something so unusual and potentially significant during my visit. One afternoon as I hiked through the park, I came across a live webcam that had been set up to monitor the area. Curious, I stopped to take a look at the footage. To my amazement, I spotted a strange, colorful bird perched on a branch just within the camera's view. The bird resembled the mythological firebird, or phoenix, a sacred creature found in many cultures. Its majestic plumage glowed brightly, emitting red, orange, and yellow light, like a bonfire that was just past the turbulent flame. I couldn't believe my eyes. Was this a mere coincidence, or was there something more to this mysterious bird's appearance? I decided to investigate further, taking photos of the bird with my camera and making notes of its behavior. As I observed, the bird seemed to have a calming presence, as if it was somehow connected to the recent geological events at the park. Word soon spread about the appearance of this mysterious firebird, and people flocked to the live webcam to catch a glimpse of the creature. Some believed that the bird's presence signaled an imminent eruption or significant geological event while others saw it as a symbol of hope and renewal amidst the chaos. As the days passed, the Firebird continued to make appearances on the live webcam, drawing the attention of experts and enthusiasts alike. Theories abounded, but no one could definitively explain the bird's origin or purpose. Eventually, the Firebird disappeared from the webcam as suddenly as it had appeared. The park returned to its usual state of unrest, but the memory of the mysterious bird lingered in the minds of those who had witnessed its beauty. Looking back on that experience, I'm still awestruck by the incredible sight of the firebird in Grand Teton National Park. While its true nature may never be known, 
Its presence in a time of uncertainty served as a reminder of the enduring power of hope and the beauty that can be found even in the midst of chaos. I am a park ranger in a remote area of the woods where few people come to visit. My days are usually filled with monitoring the wildlife and ensuring that the campers follow the rules. One day, a woman and her daughter came to fish in the river that runs through the woods. Later in the day, the woman's daughter came running towards me, telling me that she had found huge four toad tracks near the riverbank. I was curious but skeptical, as bear tracks are commonly found in these woods. However, the other fishermen who had gathered around to listen to her were nodding their heads in agreement, saying they had never seen tracks like that before. I decided to investigate the tracks for myself, and the young girl eagerly led me back to the spot. Sure enough, there were tracks that were larger than any bear tracks I had ever seen, and had four toes instead of the usual five. As I examined the tracks more closely, I noticed that they were imprinted deep into the ground, and the claw marks were clear. My mind raced as I tried to think of what animal could have made these tracks. As I was looking at the tracks, I heard rustling in the nearby bushes. I quickly grabbed my binoculars and focused them on the spot, and to my surprise, I saw a large creature moving through the brush. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before it was huge, covered in dark fur and had four legs, but moved in a way that was unlike any bear or other animal I had ever seen. I knew that the woman and her daughter had to be warned of the possible danger so I quickly made my way back to their campsite. I informed them of what I had seen and urged them to leave immediately. They quickly packed their things and left with a newfound sense of urgency. After they had left, I went back to the spot where I had seen the creature. I searched the area, but there was no sign of it. However, the tracks were still there, and they confirmed that something large and unknown had been there. As I made my way back to the ranger station, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets lay hidden in these woods, waiting to be discovered. The experience had left me both excited and fearful of what else might be out there. As a child, I always looked forward to going on long drives with my dad in his truck. This summer was no different. We were cruising down the road, enjoying our snacks when I saw something odd on the side of the road. I called out to my dad, but he didn't seem to notice it. A few minutes later, I saw it again. It was a creature running on the side of the road, but it was hazy and blurry. This time, my dad saw it too, but he shrugged it off. We continued driving, but after a while, we got a flat tire. My dad pulled over to change it, and we saw that the tire had multiple holes poked in it, as if something had bitten it. While we were changing the tire, another truck passed by, and I remember admiring its cool lights. However, we didn't think much of it at the time. As we continued our journey, we saw the same truck we had passed earlier crashed on the side of the road. Police and EMTS were already there, and we drove on that night, grateful that we had not been in that accident. Looking back, my dad and I still talk about that strange creature we saw, which he later learned was called a crawler. We wonder if it had something to do with the strange occurrences that night. Whether it was the creature or a mysterious force that saved us, we'll never know for sure. But the memory of that night still sends shivers down my spine. I was on a routine patrol in the nearby state park when I received a call about a suspicious individual seen wandering along the highway. As a park ranger, I'm responsible for ensuring the safety of visitors and enforcing park rules and regulations, but occasionally we have to lend a hand to our neighboring communities. I hopped in my truck and drove to the area to check it out. As I was driving, I remembered a story a fellow ranger had shared with me a few weeks ago about a man pushing a shopping cart in the middle of nowhere. It seemed like an odd coincidence that I was now on the lookout for a person matching that description. I decided to keep an eye out just in case. A few miles down the road, I saw him, the man with the shopping cart. He was pushing it along the shoulder of the highway, looking weary and disheveled. I pulled over and approached him cautiously. Excuse me, sir. Are you okay? 
Do you need any help? I asked him. He looked up at me with tired eyes and shook his head. No, I'm fine. Just trying to make my way to Houston, he replied. I noticed that he had a large backpack strapped to his back, and the shopping cart was filled to the brim with what appeared to be all his worldly possessions. It was clear that he was homeless and had been walking for miles. I introduced myself as a park ranger and offered to give him a ride to the nearest town where he could get some rest and food. He hesitated for a moment, but eventually accepted my offer. As we drove, he told me about his journey and how he ended up in Colorado. It turned out that he had been walking for days, trying to make his way to Houston to see his family. He had taken a shortcut through Keensburg, and that's where the driver had mistaken him for a deer. He was grateful for the ride and for someone who cared enough to check on him. As a park ranger, I'm used to dealing with all kinds of situations, but this one touched me in a different way. It was a reminder that even in the middle of nowhere, there are people who need our help and compassion. I dropped him off at a nearby shelter and wished him luck on the rest of his journey. On Monday, May 9th, 2011, around 5.45 a.m., I was on my way to work headed northbound into the village of New Miami on Seven Mile Avenue. I left the traffic light at the southernmost edge of town into a dark stretch of road when a large flying creature swooped in over my car and snatched up a small animal in the road ahead of me at the edge of my headlights. As a construction worker, I feel I can judge the size of objects fairly well. This creature had a wingspan of at least 12 feet and was jet black with a human figure. It completely blocked the view out of my windshield and then some and moved at a very high rate of speed. I was traveling between 35-40 miles per hour. It had to have been traveling at around 70-80 miles per hour. Like I stated before, it swooped down, grabbed the animal, and was gone over the trees very quickly. I've researched large predator birds and raptors indigenous to Ohio, and there are none that fit the description of what I saw. If you have any other questions about my experience, please feel free to email me back. It was June 15, 1994, a day that I still remember vividly. I was camping with my friends in the deep wilderness. The night had a coolness to it, the kind you only get when you're far away from the city lights and the sounds of civilization. There we were, tucked away in our camp, when something happened that would stay with me forever. Around midnight, I heard the sound of a large animal walking through our camp. It was coming from the dense forest, its footfalls heavy and distinct. I knew enough about the wilderness to know not to provoke a large animal, so I stayed quiet, alert, and let it pass. I listened as the sound slowly receded, the animal moving away from our camp. At five in the morning, my campmates and I gathered around the smoldering embers of our fire, sharing our experiences of the previous night. One of them even accused me of being the animal, saying he had seen a human silhouette at the time we all heard the sounds. It was a ridiculous accusation, but it added to the eeriness of the situation. Half an hour later, I was about a mile downstream when I heard a loud commotion in the gravel of a ten-foot cut bank. Thinking it was my friend playing a prank, I walked towards the noise. But as I got closer, a horrific smell hit me, something I had never smelled before. It was pungent, rotting, far worse than any animal scent I had ever encountered, even worse than my old dog on his smelliest day. I picked up a few rocks and threw them towards the source of the sound hoping to scare off whatever was there. But nothing moved, nothing ran off like a normal animal would. The smell hung in the air, the commotion stopped, and everything was eerily silent. I remember standing there, the hair on the back of my neck standing up, a chill running down my spine. I was an experienced camper, a seasoned hunter, but that day I encountered something that I couldn't explain, something that challenged my understanding of the natural world. It's an experience that I'll never forget, a story that I still tell around campfires under the starlit sky, reminding myself and others of the mysteries that the wilderness still holds. I've always had an affinity for the cold, which is why I sleep with the windows open, even in winter. 
My apartment is nestled high enough, about three stories off the ground, ensuring that the chill winds are my only nocturnal visitors. Where I live, deer move about mostly at night, and their soft footsteps rustling through the fallen leaves have become my usual lullaby. It was eerie at first, but over the years I've grown accustomed to it. One night, however, something sounded amiss. Amidst the usual patter of deer hooves, there was a new, distinct rustle something fast, something unnatural. A sudden alarm snort rang out, followed by frantic thuds, as if the deer were scattering in terror. Then came the barking, a cacophony of distress calls, and sounds of dragging and snorting that sent shivers down my spine. Underneath my blanket, my palms were sweaty, my heartbeat echoing in my ears. I was paralyzed with fear, my mind conjuring up images of unknown horrors lurking beneath my window. The noises eventually faded into an eerie silence, and I mustered the courage to close the windows, barricading myself from the ominous unknown. Sleep came hesitantly, the echoes of the night's terror still fresh in my ears. When dawn broke, I ventured outside. There was little evidence of the nocturnal chaos, just some fresh dirt, displaced in the deer's frantic escape. But that night taught me some valuable lessons, ones that will forever resonate with me. Never venture into the woods without a lamp and a gun. And if you must, never go alone. The woods have their secrets, secrets that are best left undiscovered in the dead of the night. Growing up in the heart of rural southeast Kansas was an adventure in itself. My childhood was filled with the thrill of exploring the great outdoors, traversing the tall grass prairies, and adventuring into the unknown with my friends. Our ages ranged from 10 to 14, and our ventures were led by youthful curiosity, armed only with pellet and BB guns, and maybe a knife for good measure. On one such adventure, we set out after dusk towards a shallow creek that meandered through a small forest about a mile from my best friend's house. The thrill of the nocturnal expedition had us buzzing with excitement, but that excitement was soon replaced with an unnerving sensation. The deeper we ventured into the woods, the more we felt an eerie sense of being watched. An inexplicable feeling that something was trailing us, hidden in the inky blackness of the night. Despite our efforts, we couldn't spot what was triggering our primal instincts. A sense of dread washed over us, and instinctively we huddled together, facing outward, each one of us on high alert. Deciding that we had had enough of the woods for the night, we bolted out of the forest, our feet crunching the dried leaves, hearts pounding. As we emerged into the tall grass prairie that led back to the house, I dared to glance back at the tree line. There, I caught a glimpse of what seemed like a mountain lion's tail disappearing into a bush. The sight sent a shiver down my spine, and I quickly urged my friends to stay close as we made our way back home. Once safe, we confided in my friend's father, who worked for the local parks and rec department and was well acquainted with the fish and game personnel. Officially, we were told that there were no big cats in southeast Kansas. However, he shared that there had been some whispers about a potentially untracked male mountain lion in the area. From that day onwards, our adventures held a hint of trepidation, a constant reminder of the wild and unpredictable nature of the world we so eagerly sought to explore. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I always was so amazed at the beauty of Algonquin Park in Muskoka and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every summer. Our cottage was on a large lake, about a 30-minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around campfires with family and friends. I spent every summer there growing up, and it still brings fond memories of sunshine and laughter and the sound of motorboats on the lake. But the winters were different. The people that didn't live there all year would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so. But for the most part the lake was silent during the winters, 
and the town was just filled with locals. The beautiful pine trees are always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road. There were about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out, however, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees. My dad had needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. It was at the end of February, and it was a long weekend so I tagged along so he wouldn't be alone, and we could spend some quality time together. It was about a five-hour drive from our home, but turned out to be an eight-hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early, and it was around midnight as we drove through Algonquin Park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black, except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park, with only about 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It had stopped snowing, and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be until later the next day that we would even see a snowplow. As we drove down the road, I noticed there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of the car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the? My dad mumbled. As we drove past the white van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat illuminated by our retreating tail lights. I told my dad this and he shrugged. Maybe they're lost. I nodded but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead end road and why they would feel the need to park there. As we pulled into our driveway and we started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about that van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of sleeping downstairs in the room my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of the forest, and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark even without seeing the white van. It wasn't a big deal when my sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned all the lights off, and I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try and get through one last chapter before bed. It was so quiet I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. The living room had large windows also with no curtains that overlooked the lake, and it was black except for a light or two from cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that the cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was beautiful, and I walked towards the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye, and I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch, below the window barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was sleeping, my heart in my throat. I wasn't sure if they had seen me or not. I woke my dad up, and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen the figures, two sets of footprints in the snow lead back around to the front of the cottage and back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare anyone off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified I'd look out the window and see someone staring back at me. The next morning my dad went outside and confirmed that there were two sets of footprints leading from the road to in behind our cottage, and then back around to the front of the cottage and back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around and then gone back up to the main road. My dad guessed that they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff as it was the middle of winter, and not too many people were up at the lake. But they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage, and my dad's car parked out front. They also may have seen the lamp I had turned on to read, 
and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to that, and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently there had been some break-ins in the area, and some stuff had been stolen from some cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, and I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly has people inside it? I'd wanted to be a police officer ever since I was just a little boy. I have dressed up for one every single Halloween that I can remember. There simply wasn't any other job that I ever had an interest in. This is probably due to the fact that my own father was a more well-known officer in the LAPD and my role model for everything in my life. As soon as I completed high school, I immediately tried to get enrolled in the police academy, got accepted, and began my training. Recently, I just celebrated 10 years since getting my gun and badge. I've loved every minute of the job. Thanks to my father, I've met all kinds of twisted and dangerous deranged people though, but I've never felt scared. Every encounter with them just made my desire to protect and serve stronger. That's why the only time I've ever actually felt fear was when I was confronted with something non-human. It's something I still can't explain today. It happened sometime in August. Me and my partner were in our car and we got a call over the radio from an address not far from us. A man calling 911 claimed there was an intruder in his house. We rushed to the address as fast as possible and got to the front door. There was no sign of a forced entry, but the door was unlocked, so we very slowly went inside and began scouting the house. After a couple of minutes, there was only one room left that we did not clear, and the door was locked. And we stated that we were the police, and the owner of the house opened the door, coming out of the bathroom with a knife in his hands. As soon as he saw us, he looked relieved and put down the weapon. He explained that he lives there alone, and he heard a door in the house open and close just before he fled, walking himself in the bathroom. There wasn't really much we could do to help. We looked around for any shoe prints or tracks or fingerprints, but nothing. There was no sign of anybody coming in. We advised him to lock the door and call us again if anything happened or if he saw anything. We were going to head back. That same night, the dispatcher got a call from the same address and again. It was the same man claiming somebody is inside the house trying to break in the bathroom door. He truly sounded sincere and looked worried. This time, the front door was locked and we had to break in. But after scouting the house again, we did not find anybody inside. Also, no signs of a forced entry either. When the man came out of the bathroom, he was pale and looked rather terrified. After we talked to him again, my partner and I went outside and discussed the situation in private. We were absolutely sure nobody else could have been in the house, but we also agreed he doesn't look like he is making things up or crazy or delusional. He was your average 40-year-old man. We concluded that he might be delusional, though, so we decided to go through his medical records to see if we can dig up anything in his past. Perhaps there was a possibility of mental illness. We did not learn anything that would support this idea, but we did find something very strange. This man in the past had reported his wife missing about a week earlier. Police still had not found her. I asked around a little bit. I could not find much. Something was off about all of it. I could not sleep that night, thinking about everything. We had checked multiple records and after time, discovered that he didn't try to contact the police or anything about his wife since the day he had reported her missing. He was becoming more and more suspicious. So one evening, I decided to stake out at his house to see if I can find out anything. I parked my personal vehicle nearby and waited. Around midnight, the police got a call again. It was from the same man claiming somebody was inside. I've been outside his house now for the last couple of hours and was definitely sure nobody got in or out. A little bit after the call, I could see a silhouette walking around the house. I contacted the dispatcher. He told them he was hiding in the bathroom. I was completely puzzled and clueless about what is happening, so I decided to go inside alone instead of waiting for backup. I was certain somebody was going to walk in the house. I picked a lock and slowly made my way inside, sneaking around. 
I could hear somebody banging on the door of the bathroom. When I got closer, nobody was there, and the only sound was the man crying in the bathroom. I managed to get him to come out and sat down to talk to him. I assured him that I believe that something is going on, confronting him about his missing wife. As soon as I mentioned her, his expression and demeanor changed completely. He didn't look sad, just some sort of worried, and said that she had been gone now for a while. He didn't get any news or updates from the police. Something was off about the entire situation, but I could not put my finger on it, not yet. We had finished the conversation. I told him I will come back again to ask some more questions and began to leave the house. He remained sitting on the sofa. I was almost out the front door when I heard steps behind me. I thought he was following me, but when I turned around he wasn't there. Instead, I saw a figure in a white dress approaching him. I pulled out my gun and slowly pointed it at the figure. When the man noticed the silhouette as well, he let out a horrifying scream. At first, after the scream, I could hear him mumbling something about being impossible, and I heard him apologize. He was screaming that he is sorry. I was completely puzzled. Then things became even more strange and unexplainable. The figure in the white dress grabbed the man by his neck and began choking him. I began to yell, commanding it to stop, but it did not listen. I took a shot aiming at the shoulder, but the bullet passed right through it. And now I'm scared and confused. So I mindlessly fire three more rounds, and all of them ended up going straight through. I charged with my body to grab the person or thing and went through it as well, hitting into the wall. My mind could not comprehend what had happened. I looked up. The figure was clearly a woman. Her face was expressionless and she did not speak. She stood there choking the man before my very eyes. I could not do anything. I called for backup on my radio, but pretty soon the man on the sofa had collapsed. The woman in the white dress released his body and began walking away towards the yard. I stood up, checked the man's pulse. He wasn't breathing. He was dead. So I decided to follow the woman. She walked away slowly without making a sound toward the tree in the garden, and then finally vanishing. When I got to the tree, I saw the dirt under it that it was different than the rest of the garden. I began digging with my bare hands. After a little while, the stench. I began digging even faster and discovered a body, rather a head to be more precise. The skin was already decomposing, and half the flesh was devoured. When the paramedics arrived, they examined the man and could see my pile of vomit right next to it. After I'd found it, the reason of death was concluded to be asphyxiation, but there were no visible marks that would indicate somebody had strangled him. The only thing paramedics could conclude is that he had stopped breathing. But I know what happened. I don't know how it's possible, but I am certain that the ghost of his dead wife, I sound so ridiculous even typing this out, but the ghost of his dead wife that was buried in the yard came back and had its revenge. For the rest of the police and doctors, this man's death will stay a mystery. I will not say what I saw. I would have my badge revoked and be sent off to the loony bin. Nobody would believe me. But after this, I believe that paranormal and ghosts are very, very real. I had just enlisted in the Forest Service in 26 and was working in the Algonquin Park for the summertime. I never understood why they paid me as little as they did for all the things I had to deal with. To give you some more context, the Algonquin Park is this massive wildlife preserve full of moose, black bears, elk, etc. And this is why it makes it such an excellent tourist trap. We're always finding weird things too, like tracks and scat, which is pretty normal but not when you find human-looking scat and four times the size. That's when things begin to get very unnerving. In fact, I had several people on a trail, a very popular trail, which name and route I won't mention, but they had reported seeing very large piles of human scat along the side. After being disgusted, thinking somebody could not wait to find the bathroom, or was just simply going in the great outdoors far too close to a road that people travel after inspection, this was far larger than any human could produce. Also around the scat pile were these massive footprints that were evidently from a bipedal being. 
Nearby these prints are large blackberry bushes, meaning that whatever was around here was probably eating berries and doing its business. I never thought Bigfoot was a possibility, but the more and more I see this kind of stuff, the more evidence I'm exposed to, the more I'm becoming a believer, I should say. My most recent one was fairly tame compared to some of the encounters I've had. Me and my now ex-girlfriend then girlfriend had decided to take a hiking trip. We rented a small one-bedroom cabin near the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina. Our plan was just to spend the days hiking and enjoying the scenery and come back to the bed. At night everything was great. For the first three days we had only rented the cabin for three days, but we wanted to still hike so we put everything in our car parked at one of the trailheads. I decided that we were going to spend the night out on the trail. It was about noon when we started hiking. Everything was great we decided at about 7.30 that night we would set up camp on the side of the trail. That's when I began hearing strange noises coming from the woods. I also smelled the familiar smell. I told my girlfriend we need to leave, but she didn't listen she said it was fine, and it was too dark to go back anyways. Somehow she convinced me that everything was going to be okay even though in the back of my mind I knew what was in those woods, as I have had several encountered before this. We settled in the camp, cooked dinner at food and were getting ready for bed when I got this terrible feeling. I'm not one to trust my gut feeling normally, but hearing those noises and smelling that smell, I told my girlfriend we need to go now. So we grabbed a couple things, flashlights, my hunting rifle, extra batteries, first aid kit, that kind of stuff. And we were going to hike to the ranger station about five miles away. As we begin hiking there, I'm hearing something running through the woods, almost keeping pace with us. When I stopped, it stopped. And as soon as I started walking again, it started walking again. I didn't know what to do. At this point, my girlfriend, thinking it was just a bear, told me to get my gun out and shoot at it. I told her, no, it's not a bear. It's something worse. She was confused. I told her we should just keep walking if it's not showing itself to us right. Now there's a reason, so we continue walking to the ranger station. We got the clearing where the ranger station was. That's when I actually saw it. This particular dogman was about eight feet tall and either dark gray or black. I told my girlfriend to run and to get to the ranger station and get inside. It wasn't very far, only about a hundred feet. I was right behind her keeping my eye on the dogman. The entire time we made it inside safely and told the ranger that was on duty about what happened. He said he'd seen this thing before and that we were lucky to survive. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.